this week on the Back Table Podcast. Generally, like six to eight weeks is kind of the classic time frame where they're going to be done, quote unquote, with seeing me. I sometimes will give patients and say, do these exercises for the next one, two or three months, especially if they've maybe had a little bit more rocky of a time during their treatment. Like do these for the next three months or one month, depending on the person to just really solidify, really solidify this habituation process, really make sure you're on solid ground, you're where you need to be, and then you can kind of start tapering off from there. And then we'll check in with the patient kind of a long-term basis. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT Podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. My name is Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. And I'm here with my lovely co-host, Dr. Ashley Agan. Hey, y'all. I, I'm also um, an otolaryngologist. I practice general ENT in Dallas, Texas. We have a very, very exciting topic, and I'm going to let you introduce our speaker and topic. We're very lucky to have Matthew Johnston on the podcast today. He's a physical therapist in Philadelphia, and he has a special focus on vestibular rehab. Bless his heart. He's taking care of all of our dizzy patients. Uh, he obtained his doctor of physical therapy at mm -hmm. Temple University in 2016, and he practices at Excel Physical Therapy in Northeast Philadelphia. He's here today to talk to us about evaluation and treatment for vestibular problems from the rehab perspective. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you both for having me. I'm extremely excited to be here. I'm looking forward to sharing, you know, the other side of the patient experience on the physical therapy side and just looking to learn from you guys and share some information. Yeah, well, we, we appreciate you. Well, we're happy to have you. These are tough patients and it's huge to be able to share patients with you guys. Start off telling us a little bit about yourself and your practice and maybe how, how does one decide that I want to spend all day taking care of dizzy patients? Sure. Yeah. So I'm a physical therapist. I graduated in 2016 from Temple and just started out in the vestibular therapy setting. Um, I treat orthopedics as well, but there's a really nice kind of like collaboration with both of those specialties. But just started treating. I've been treating this patient population for a while. Um, so I see anything, you know, and everything vestibular, concussions, headaches, dizziness, migraines, vertigo. So kind of you name it, anything that kind of crosses my way, you know, I'm happy to to treat at least or evaluate or make sure, you know, they're getting to the right places. But for the most part, anything with the word dizzy in it, I generally will treat. And is that something that you kind of had to subspecialize in or is that something like, oh, I took this elective in physical therapy school and I loved it. How, how does that fit? Work? How did it happen? So for me personally, I, there was an elective offered when I went to Temple. Um, so it was a 10 week elective with that just focused on vestibular therapy. For the most part, you know, in physical therapy school, you might see anywhere from like a couple lectures to two weeks of, of actual information on vestibular therapy. So we were really lucky at Temple to have a ton of extra time comparatively to focus on this area, deep dive in some topics. Uh, and then I was also fortunate to have a three month internship at a clinic where all they saw was vestibular therapy, like 100% of the time. So uh, wow. it was really, you know, to get those reps in was it was super important. And to see the, the weird stuff that you don't always get to see and, you know, eye patterns and movements that a typical therapist might not see was really important. And I think that gave me a really good head start into the profession and to the, the vestibular therapy world. Uh, but it is something that's kind of growing in terms of its educational offerings. There's a lot of coursework out there. Emory does a week long like competency course. And then there's some like residencies kind of popping up a little bit more like specialization in the field. A lot of it has been kind of lumped in the neuro and like the neurological specialty in physical therapy. But there is it's kind of like moving away from that a little bit, I think, and, and just kind of becoming its own subspecialty because not every vestibular therapist treats neurological patients. So it's it, it's kind of forming its own specialty in the field. That's cool. So you feel like maybe just because of all the exposure you were able to have to it, it just kind of, you know, made you say, hey, this this fits for me. I, I enjoy this. I want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. It was something that I was I always had a little bit of interest in. You know, I had some family members who had some of these problems and conditions and just kind of like fell into it with my internship and just kind of like fell in love, you know, with the, with the patient population and, and really enjoyed treating them. And it was something that was different from just like the regular low back pain or shoulder pain that you see on a regular basis. 
And at that clinic, was it all physical therapists? Uh, was there like neurologists there, ENTs there, audiologists, like who were all involved in the clinic during your, during your training? That's a great question. At the clinic that I was at, unfortunately, it was just physical therapy, um, but there was a lot of close relationships with ENT colleagues, neuro, neuro colleagues, primary care. A lot comes from primary care and a lot comes from like the community. You know, a lot of our patients come from workshops and community talks that we do that just kind of cater to this population, maybe the older adult over 50 and just something that we get out and talk. You know, I talk maybe like two or three times a year to certain groups and a lot of our patients come from there just to work on, even like, even if it's just balanced stuff too. So a lot of it just comes from the community. Some comes from like specialists and some comes from like primary care. So maybe we can jump into the um, evaluation process and what, kind of what things look like in your clinic. So I send you a dizzy patient. So maybe I've made the diagnosis of, you know, something like BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or maybe I, you know, we're suspecting some sort of vestibular hyperfunction or something. But regardless, or, or maybe I'm just like, you're dizzy and... Your workup is negative and, it's a and family maybe, member. Maybe, yeah, maybe this it's that family maybe member. This, this person can help you. What do things look like once they, they meet you? I usually tell patients that you guys will do an initial evaluation and kind of make a treatment plan. What um, what does that look like? That's a great question. And I, I think the best answer is it kind of looks like a thorough process and there needs to be a, a solid framework. And I think the best way to do that is get a lot of reps in um, treating these patients first and foremost like a very thorough, long history taking, trying to understand where, when this happened, was it sudden, you know, what their symptom patterns are looking like. The duration of symptoms can tell you a lot about what type of thing we're dealing with, what provokes it, what makes it better, you know, trying to rule out some red flags in the process. So that subjective history, really getting that patient's story is extremely important. Um, it kind of sets up the next part of the exam, which is that physical exam. But the subjective history, we're really kind of talking with the patient, understanding their story, but also getting some like the psychosocial aspects of their care. You know, are they really nervous about this? Are they like, I haven't gone out and bike ride, you know, in a year because I was afraid, you know, that's when it all started. You know, so those kind of things where it's not just like this makes it worse and this makes it better, but some of those other things that are going to kind of nuance our treatment, a lot of that comes from like the, the history taking and the, the story that the patients tell the next part is more of that physical exam. And that might be something the ENTs are maybe more familiar with, a very thorough ocular motor exam, you know, a head impulse test, the dynamic static balance testing, and then the positional tests. That's probably what we see most often, actually. ENTs will put patients on the table and most of the patients will come back and say, well, they put me on the table and this happened. And I got really dizzy and then they sent me to you. So that's usually yeah. like <laughs> the, the most kind of common thing that we see or hear, I guess, from patients. But the subjective history is really important to kind of set up the next step. What are some of the red flags you mentioned? A lot actually is blood pressure rela related. Uh, more often than not, we send patients away because their blood pressure is inappropriate for us to see. It's sending them back to their primary care for further management. Sometimes in rare occasions, it's like you need to go to the hospital. We, you know, we call the primary care and they say, no, send them, send them right over to their emergency, emergency department. That's probably the biggest thing that we kind of stop session for. And then other things, you know, we'll see some vertical eye movements um, that might be concerning for us. We might see some things that like everything is negative. We've done maybe some initial treatment and still quite aren't sure it's vestibular oriented. So that might be something that might warrant at least further imaging or further workup might not be quote unquote a red flag, but something that we need a little more collaboration with. But by and large, and at least in my experience with the patients I see, some sort of cardiovascular suspected stroke or blood pressure issue. And then, you know, rare occasions, we might see some central findings that might indicate some sort of lesion or tumor or some sort of malignancy that, you know, we might be concerned about. Is it usually high, high blood pressure or low blood pressure that you guys are seeing that's concerning? Probably 95% of the time it's high. Anywhere, you know, 190 or higher, you know, 200s. Yeah, like just, you know, something one over 120, but things that are, I'm nervous for you to be here. Right. Or are you yeah. taking, you know, some of those kind of things like that. Like, you know, <laughs> not just aren't you yeah. not taking your medications, but things that <laughs> Do you warrant. feel okay? <laughs> yeah. And Do you have a headache? <laughs> right, right, right. And especially when they come in with complaints of dizziness, you know, that in combination kind of gets us a little nervous. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. By and large, you know, that's that's on the rare occasion. 
So can we get into the physical exam a little bit more detail? Like I don't have friends on lenses, okay? And I, I see kids. I probably see maybe two dizzy kids a year and they're usually teenagers, although I've had as young as eight. That being said, my physical exam, I don't know. I, you know, I'll do a little, as long as they don't have any nick issues, like head shake, head thrust, you know, I'll make sure they can do a tandem walk, check their cerebellar function. Um, I'll do a Dick's Hall Pike. Is that the kind of stuff or go through it with me? Tell me exactly what you're doing. What you just said is, is a lot of what we do. I think the systematic approach is important. You know, obviously screening vitals first, but then a thorough ocular motor exam, like how does, how well do their eyes track? You know, can they hit one target to the next target to look at saccades? What does their vestibular ocular reflex look like? Can they maintain that vestibular ocular reflex for 30 seconds um, horizontally, vertically? I might, we're going to do a VOR cancellation test. Pretty much all of my patients will get a very thorough ocular motor exam. Do you use any equipment to help you with your ocular motor exam or is it all just like follow my finger, yeah, I'm looking at yeah. your eyes kind of thing? It's usually a pen, <laughs> a pen <laughs> okay. and my hand. Um, we don't have uh, Frenzel lenses or goggles at our office. Um, I've worked with those in the past, and they are definitely gold standard, something that is kind of best practice, something that's going to get us the most accurate answer. And sometimes we do refer patients out for that specific type of, of testing. Uh, but in the setting or practice that I, I work at, um, it's really just follow the, follow the pen. You know, let me cover one eye or the other for, you know, occluding vision or the cross-cover test, um, that hints to infarct test. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, but that's something we use on like a daily basis. I'm not familiar with it. Please explain. Sure, sure. It's, so it's a hints to infarct. So it's looking for a uh, stroke in patients that might present with acute onset of dizziness. So it's a, an acronym that is pretty sensitive for ruling out cerebrovascular or, or stroke events. Um, and it's something that used, I think it was originally developed in the emerging department. Um, it has become a really good tool, not something that Usually by the time they make it to see me, unless they're coming under what's called direct access or without a prescription, um, or they're a current patient that we're seeing, you know, oh my God, I woke up yesterday and had horrible dizziness and we're seeing them for evaluation. Most of the time that ends up being negative. I don't think I've ever had anyone that's like, oh my God, you need to be sent to the emergency department. Um, but it's a really good exam. It's a really good thorough thing that you can put into an examination, especially for patients that might be more at risk. What are the, some of the items on that? Sure. So we're looking at like a head impulse test. Um, is the, if the head impulse test is negative, we are looking at a skew deviation, like if they have any vertical movement of the eye, um, do they have a head tilt? Think about like someone who's like uncompensated for hypofunction. They might present that way, but if some of the testing is negative, that might be leading us to more a stroke-like condition. Interesting. What, what kinds of other things are on your physical exam? Sorry, I interrupted you as you were going through your eye movement. <laughs> That's okay. Eye <laughs> So yeah, after that ocular motor exam, most of the time we're going to screen their balance. Statically, the monphicatsib is, is the test that we call. Um, so looking at them in, you know, feet together, tandem balance, single leg, eyes open, eyes closed, and then on the foam or compliance surface, especially foam, eyes closed, can tell us the most about the vestibular system. Um, so that so if someone like falls right over with that, okay, maybe I'm thinking, is there something more acute happening or is there something that definitely is pointing towards the vestibular system with this type of person? Do you have to modify that? You know, I'm imagining some of these older patients that, you know, are barely just standing on hard ground sometimes at putting them on foam and seeing what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, all of this is patient dependent and what they tolerate. You know, someone who might have some knee pain or some back pain or can't stand for too long, we're going to modify some of these things with you know, instead of feet together, it might be feet apart. Instead of standing on one leg, we might go for like a tandem or a semi-tandem. We might skip the foam for that day until they build up some tolerance. So a lot of it is what they come in with and matching our exam. You know, we're not trying to fit patients into like, here's our box and we have to do everything just because it's what we have to do. There are some like important information that we need to get just to make sure they're, this is like a person that's safe to be here. And there's no more, you know, there are no red flags happening. But by and large, we can modify these exam points and start where the patient's ready, you know, like it's all adapted to what they're, they're capable of and what they're kind of bringing with them in terms of past medical history or social history and, and stuff like that. Yeah, that makes sense. And the foam test, it's literally you're getting like one of those egg crate foams, putting it on the ground and having the patient do some of the balance work, tandem, leg up, standing on the foam. Is that what you're saying with that test? Essentially, yeah, we've used these like blue Airax pads or kind of a squishier compliant surface. 
Um, most of the time, it's like feet together, eyes open, eyes closed, kind of a, a basic screening. Um, for someone like maybe you might see Gopi is like a younger person, an athlete, we might make them do like single leg or single leg with head movements or something like more advanced. But again, it's kind of like adapting what we're doing and scaling it up or scaling it down, depending on what the patient's capable of doing or what their goals are. You know, if their goal is to be flipping in the air, doing gymnastics, we're going to do something more aggressive and, and something that might be more, more challenging to them. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, way, way back in the day when we were learning about all of the vestibular <laughs> tests, when someone is standing on foam and their eyes are closed, they are purely relying on their vestibular system for their balance, right? Because they don't have the that's proper exactly section. Right. Yeah. They don't have visual cues. So you're kind of able yeah, to that's isolate. It. memory. <laughs> <laughs> that's about as far as it goes. Clearing, <laughs> clearing that cobweb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's some very yeah, dusty and, and that information. To me, to me, that's like the most the one that I want to get to the most because it's going to give me like pass or fail. Can they make 30 seconds? Can they not? If they, if they can, if they only make one or two seconds and they're right over, okay, I, that's going to give me a lot of information of like how functioning or how functional this system is. That makes sense. Any, any other physical exam maneuvers that we, that we missed? I think the most important and maybe the things that you guys are most familiar with are positional testing for BPPV uh, or the positional vertigo. Usually we'll have patients go from sitting to supine first. We're assessing eye motion or nystagmus in that position. That's going to tell us about horizontal canal function. I have a preference for just turning patients on their side, either left or right, for a, a roll test. Um, some therapists will just move the head. I've just never had, had good experience getting patients all the way to the degrees that I want them to. So I generally just have them just like turn on their side. It's usually easier. Um, so I'm assessing for geotropic or apogeotropic nystagmus there and symptom reproduction, of course. And then finally, it's those Dix Hall Pike positions off the edge of the table um, or in a modified position to see if their posterior or anterior canals are involved. Yeah, I think that's the that can be the challenge for me sometimes because we don't have like a table the way you do like in a physical therapy gym. So we have, or I guess one of one clinic does, but the other clinic, we just kind of have the chair. So I have to kind of mm. make the chair flat like a table and then have, a, yeah, we kind of, you know, we make it work most of the time, but yeah, we just don't have the same, we don't have a gym the way you guys do. So I think some of the maneuvers can be a little bit trickier depending on the patient. Yeah, I, I totally agree. How important is the subjective? So you don't see any nystagmus, but you sit them back up and they're, the room is spinning for them. How important is that to you in your evaluation? So we're always constantly weighing, especially like the positional tests can be tricky, I think, you know, the speed of movement, you know, the is the head in the right position. I think the anatomy books or maybe what people learn in school as the, you know, the canal system is oriented exactly 45 is not quite right because it might you might have to give that person maybe 55 degrees of rotation or 10 degrees of rotation or they might can't get into the position. So sometimes you have to you might have to do the positional testing more than once. And it and it kind of depends on what the person's coming into the clinic with in terms of their mobility and, you know, not only joint wise, like neck, can they move it, but like their body mechanics, can they, do they have a hard time going from laying down to sitting up normally, you know, and now you add this dizziness component to it. So you're going to get, you might get false positives or false negatives and, and you might have to kind of think about what's the most likely cause of things, you know, for every time patient says, I it turn, every time I turn to my right and it happens, I get a left positive. <laughs> so you have to kind of weigh these factors. Yeah. And if someone sits up and I'm seeing no nystagmus throughout the whole process, usually with sitting up symptoms, I'm more thinking towards a hypofunction or something else. Usually I'm looking for that descent symptoms. Uh, and that's going to tell me, at least personally, where, you know, where I'm going to start. And sometimes I'll treat something and send the patient home and say, well, let's see how that goes. Yeah. I think that makes sense. But that's a really good question because they don't always have nystagmus. Yeah, they frequently don't. Like when when people actually have the perfect, you know, rotary nystagmus, like I feel like I almost like I cheer. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm wow. like, all right, we we definitely, we <laughs> right, found it. Right. You know, they're like, whoa, um, <laughs> yeah. like this is a great type of dizziness to have. We're going to cure you. It's going to be great. But yeah. yeah, a lot of the times, you know, they might feel a little dizzy or they, di you know, it's just, they don't quite have it. And well, then, that's why they're coming to us, yeah. right? And yeah. then I... And then I send them to you guys and I say, you're going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's validating for patients to like, oh my gosh, you're actually seeing it. You know, this is what the ENT saw or, you know, they couldn't make it happen, but then therapy gets it to happen or vice versa. So I, I think them knowing that it's actually having the nystagmus is very validating. 
but on the other side, it can be very, uh, tricky to navigate when, when you put patients down and be like, well, the ENT did this and I was really dizzy. And then they get to you a week later or two weeks later or whatever, and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so that can be kind of tricky to navigate. And some patients just clear on their own by the time they get to see us. So, and sometimes you can't make it happen, but they still have ongoing dizziness. And then you, you might have the course correct with a whole different plan of care. So it's all very, very, very adaptable and very, you know, I don't say complicated because that's not the right word, but. I would say it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated for me sometimes. <laughs> for sure. But I think I once you know the rules and that like once you know the rules and have the framework in place, I think it becomes a little more simple. But there is there is some nuance. You know, I won't totally discredit my profession, but like there is there is a lot of nuance happening um, and there's a lot of weighing of factors because it's not always going to look the same and things can fatigue like nystagmus can fatigue in certain cases. So. Yeah, it's it's it can be totally variable in the day. You might bring them in for an eval on Monday and you find nothing. And then second visit on Wednesday is when they have like the worst dizziness of all time. So yeah. it, it can be surprising sometimes. So let's talk about BPPV. OK, how do you diagnose it from your standpoint? And then what are what are, are you doing the EPLI for them? And then being like, OK, see ya. How, how does it work? Sure. Yeah, I think this is a great question because like you mentioned before, we're looking for symptom reproduction and we're looking for an astagmus in any of the positional tests. So if someone has, we'll go with the most common one, someone gets put back in the Dix Hall Pike on the right um, and they have that beating, you know, torsional nystagmus, that's a pretty solid test for posterior canal abominant. You know, and then I'm weighing the time frame. So if it's, if it's less than a minute, it's in the canal. If it's more than a minute, it's stuck on the opening or the ambula. So it's, you're, it's a lot of timing. It's a lot of assessing symptoms. You kind of get a, an idea of when the nystagmus starts to like dissipate. And that's going to give you a little bit more information about how intense this person's symptoms might be and like how, you know, break times and stuff like that. So a lot of it is which positional test is, is positive. I always tell patients there's 12 possibilities. You have three canals on each side plus an opening on each side. So there's there are 12 options for where it could be. <laughs> Usually the anterior canal is pretty unlikely unless they're in like a rollover car accident. They're a gymnast. They were unfortunately involved in some sort of explosion or some sort of major head trauma. But by and large, horizontal canal or posterior canal, you know, we're looking at, you know, at least four different canals there. So explain this to me that had the 12, where the 12 is coming from. Cause, <laughs> because sure, I'm counting sure, sure, sure. like <laughs> three or four on each side, that gives me like eight or is, is it, are we talking about combinations? Like if you have like. <laughs> so we're, we're talking about, you have an anterior, posterior and horizontal canal on each side. So that's our six, mm -hmm. but in each of those options. So each posterior canal, the crystals or the odoconia can be stuck in the canal itself, or they can be stuck in the opening okay, of the gotcha. canal or the ampulla. So, times, okay. so that doubles us to 12. Gotcha. Thank yeah. you for breaking uh, that down for and me. <laughs> no problem, no problem. And I think that's an important thing, like to not necessarily on your guys's and to like distinguish, like, are we talking about a canal of thiasis or a, a cubulolithiasis? of thiasis, but something that is it in the horizontal canal or the posterior canal and at least having that like framework. If you're going to put someone in a horizontal canal, nothing happens, but they're really describing this positional room spinning vertigo you know, there could be other possibilities too. So, and, and it might not show up on that posterior Dick's Hall Pike. And, and finding the location is kind of the crux of prescribing the right exercise, right? Can you talk kind of a little bit about that? Yeah, you got it. That's exactly right. And I think that's where some either novice therapists or therapists that might not have exact skills in, in vestibular therapy, you know, maybe one of their patients gets some like vestibular symptoms and, and they're going to treat it just to kind of like make that patient feel better. It's really important to identify the correct canal because if you're doing an epley maneuver, for example, on a posterior canal, but the patient has horizontal canal and vomit, it's kind of a mismatch treatment and it's not quite going to work. And it's just something that you need to be aware of and, and something that you're just going to speed up the in, improvement of the patient if you're matching the treatment to the involvement of the canal. And are these just a repositioning maneuver um, when they come to see you and then are there thing, certain restrictions afterwards or exercises, I guess? Do they still do things for that specific where the where you think the lesion is or where the um, crystals are? How does the post-care for that session work? 
It kind of depends. Um, it depends. Like, I'm sure all these answers, but once I treat a patient, I might treat them with one to three maneuvers, like three different times. Like, I'll put them through an epley maybe one to three times in a session. Depends on what their tolerance is. It depends on how symptomatic they are. And then post-restriction or post-maneuver restrictions in the research hasn't been that confirmatory. So, you know, they used to put people in collars and said, don't move your head for 24, 48 hours. Yeah. <laughs> and just something that hasn't, has kind of fallen out of fad and fallen out, the research has kind of really disproven that. So for me, I usually say to kind of do your normal thing. Don't go crazy and like shake your head around, <laughs> but otherwise just kind of go through your normal day. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure you guys won't be surprised, but I think the average person would be surprised that, you know, patients are going to try to make it happen sometimes. And it's like, don't go out of your way to put yourself <laughs> in these positions um, if it's not something you need to do during your normal life. But something that I don't give a lot of restrictions in the rare cases that we clear it and then it comes back and we're kind of like fighting back and forth and we're seeing them for like multiple. If I'm working on like two weeks worth of BPPV symptoms, I might give them some restrictions, for example, to like sleep with two pillows or try to avoid looking up or down for a day or two. Like I might give them some general guidelines just to see if we can get a little bit more holding of things where they're supposed to be um, until I see them again. And that's only in the rare case where I'm like, we're fighting for two, three weeks to get something resolved. How long does PT usually, on average, do you tell patients when they first come see you specifically for BPPV? Is that like a sure. three session, we're good? Or is it like, listen, this might take four to six weeks and two, three times a week type of thing? I hate to say I have tried to avoid this answer, but <laughs> <laughs> I try to avoid this answer because the research will say one to three sessions for BPPV um, and then something like six to eight weeks for a, a vestibular hypofunction. But in my experience, there's so many factors that can dictate whether someone's getting in improvement in one to three sessions for BPPV specifically. If they can't get into the maneuver the way I we need them to do it, or the modification not quite working, or they can't tolerate it, that might be someone who needs to do a, a little bit more troubleshooting and might go beyond three visits. So I used to, when I first graduated, I would tell, oh, one to three sessions, and then patients undoubtedly <laughs> would be there more than three right. sessions. And then, yeah, that's a whole nother can of worms. Yeah, but it's like ear tubes. You say nine to, you know, six, nine to 15 months, and other maybe they fell out at six months, or they're in yeah, for three yeah. years. It's... Yeah, yeah, there's so many factors outside of our control, so... Mm -hmm. I'm, I try to avoid putting an exact time frame on it. And sometimes my colleagues will get people better first visit on eval. They won't even have to come back. And then like I'm struggling with this person for <laughs> three you. weeks or four <laughs> weeks or vice versa. So it kind of goes in waves. It depends on so many factors of mm -hmm. the patient. And it just kind of it all depends. So yeah. the research does say one, three, but I'd have to go back and look at like, is this just like college kids or is this like who, are, right, who right. is this research on? What was the average age of those people? Comorbidities, those kind yeah. of things. Um, what are your thoughts on patients doing the exercises at home on their own? You know, like that's a that's a great question. Is, should we be encouraging them to, you know, like if, if it's going to take a couple of weeks to get into PT, should we be like, OK, here's a handout, like maybe try to do, you know. An epley on yourself or, or one of the modifications, you know, there's like the forward roll or forward bend or some, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe you can yeah, talk more about that. Yeah, there is a modified one where people like are on their hands and knees and they just kind of like bow their head forward and they kind of bring it back. I've had a handful of patients come in and be like, well, I tried this thing and it, and it didn't quite work. I have not personally seen a ton of like literature or research come out about that particular one. So I just don't have personal experience with it. But we will give patients home maneuvers and that might be someone I have do it prophylactically. Like I might have say, do this once a day until I see you again next week. Or um, especially if we're having some trouble getting complete resolution, I tend to give them to that people. Do this one to three times a day. Obviously their mobility fact, you know, can they do it on their own is, is a big important like caveat to all of this. Some patients just can't get into the position or can't get the speed right. or they're at risk for converting the symptoms into the horizontal canal. And that's just going to be way more symptomatic. So it kind of depends on the patient, but I have given patients like do this for homework one to three times a day or once we get resolution and I've seen them for every three months for the last year because some people just get recurrent symptoms. Well, maybe this would be a good idea to do this every day and just kind of flush the canal and get things moving because your day to day activities aren't doing that on its own and you just need something more specific to so you can avoid having these symptoms coming back to see me. 
but each individual therapist has their own kind of style with if they give them on day one or they don't, you know, it kind of depends. Yeah. And I guess we, since you're seeing them, you can actually evaluate, okay, this person, they can do it on their own. I've watched, you know, you, you're able to see it and be like, okay, I'm comfortable with them doing it. I think, you know, I've heard in the past, like other colleagues be like, oh, don't, don't send patients home with exercises because they could convert it to, you know, different canal and then, and things are worse. And so, you know, I, I think it's, it's very patient dependent and specific. Some patients, you know, need something to do, you know, before they get to PT because they're just going crazy. So you need to give them something, but yeah, it's definitely patient specific. I get that. Yeah. I think it's, it's, I think it's appropriate for ENTs to give maneuvers for patients at home if they are confident in which canal it is. Yeah. And location. Exactly. More often than not, patients will be like, well, I'm doing these exercises and then I'll kind of make the motion of like laying on your side and turn your head up. So they're going to be doing Brant dare off exercises. And that's just something that's vague. In my opinion, it's just going to be giving, it's going to just irritate patient symptoms. There is research that is it effective? Yes. But in like acute stages, the more we can kind of line up canal environment with treatment, the more successful that patient's going to be. I have prescribed brain dare off exercises in a handful of cases. Um, and those are the people who we just can't get resolution or the testing is kind of coming up inconsistent. And then I send them to get testing with like frenzel lenses or goggles and they still just haven't quite gotten it. And I'll just say, well, just get your body moving and like maybe we just need to desensitize you. And that's where the brain dare exercises come into play. But I think if ENTs are confident and this is, you know, posterior canal, especially go for it. Do that mm-hmm. equally if there's no restrictions for the patient. The balance testing, so the VNG, how helpful is that to you? Because sometimes if, my, if I'm not sure, right, the patient has a dizzy, they're coming in for dizziness and, you know, my physical exam, my audio's hearing test is normal. My physical exam is the best nonspecific, <laughs> um, a lot of subjective, you know, I don't, haven't seen too many nystagmic changes and it's pretty subjective that, you know, hey, I feel dizzy. I might send them to vestibular testing um, just to make sure that we're not missing a peripheral etiology. And if that looks okay, and I'm not concerned about like an acute lesion, I may or may not get emerging or I might just send them straight to neurology, depending on the patient and the age and all that kind of stuff. How do you use balance testing? Can they tell you specifically like right, left, canal, ampulla, or is that something you kind of look at and decipher on your own? Because and with balance testing, they can also tell you central things as well uh, with the rotary chair and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Do you use uh, VNG to uh, supplement your evaluation and your treatment plan? More often than not, I don't have patients come into me with testing already done. Usually that's going to be something that we've troubleshooted in the clinic. We've done some, you know, maneuvers. They might have had short term resolution of some things, but it's kind of persistent. It's recurring. Or the examination is kind of inconclusive. Maybe we've done like four weeks of habituation training or desensitization training um, with some VOR exercises or something, just kind of general activity, and they just haven't gotten improvement. That might be some more thing where we collaborate with the referring physician, ENT, neurology about, hey, this might be something that's going to tell us definitively where and what we're dealing with. And if it's something that's peripheral, maybe that gives us clearance to continue treatment. But if it's something that shows up maybe at central or no vestibular involvement at all, either we have to look somewhere else like cervical spine or something else as a, like another non-physical therapy pathology. But more often than not, patients don't necessarily come in with that type of intervention unless, in my opinion, unless they've like had symptoms for a long time, maybe they had a course of PT or they've been through several different providers and they've gotten that in the the workup. And then they're coming to see me as maybe a second opinion or like another trial of PT, depending on, you know, their situation. But more often than not, I don't know if that's just the practice pattern in Philadelphia, but more often than not, these patients are coming without any testing. Okay. Rare occasions will come in with an MRI at at most. So another thing that I think about when I'm sending patients to you guys, um, sometimes the the act of doing the therapy can be, um, can make you really dizzy, right? Can make you, you know, nauseated, maybe even throw up. Is there any... Any reason to, you know, routinely send these patients out with a with a script for some sort of antiemetic like meclizine or Zofran that they can have, you know, to either take before PT or um, 
or just to have in case they leave, you know, your office uh, feeling How taboo like, is it? <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> like, is it given a candy bar to a diabetic or is it, you know, what are we, how bad is it? I love this question because I think it is something that there's a lot of debate about. If you ask five different therapists, you might get five different answers. If you ask five different ENTs, you might get five different answers. So like there's a lot of debate. So I think if there's very clear guidelines about how it's being prescribed, and this is obviously just my opinion, and it's like take this only when you get dizzy versus take this three times a day every day um, without any guidelines of like when to stop. To me, I think that's an important distinction. I'm personally totally fine with patients who take Meclizine. I generally will be able to bring out their symptoms, whether they're taking it or not. So I feel like it doesn't matter to me too much, but some therapists might say that it's masking symptoms or it's masking eye motion or positional testing findings. But I, I, I haven't found that that's the case. You know, whether patients are taking it or not, I tend to just kind of do things as normal. I do think it's a great idea for patients who are extremely nauseous or extremely sensitive, extremely prone to, to throwing up or have like very bad autonomic symptoms when we go through, you know, they feel faint or they can't get back up into a sitting position. Like those things happen. And I think having them have some sort of precursory medication to get through the testing could be really beneficial. And I think there's some research on how prolonged use of meclizine especially can be ototoxic for patients. Um, so I think definitive timeframes are important. Take this for the next four weeks. If it's not helping or you're not better, maybe we need to stop or look into vestibular therapy or look into some sort of next step or next intervention for the patient. I, I just think that patients rely so heavily on it that guidelines and expectations are really important because if they do get better, trying to wean off of that can be challenging, I think. Yeah, it's such a good point. I, I've definitely, you know, had the occasional patient that was diagnosed with, you know, just vertigo 20 years ago and they take their meclizine every day, three times a day for their vertigo. And, um, and you're just like, Oh no, we need to get you off of this. It's like Afrin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's like the Afrin. But, but, um, but yeah, it makes sense. You know, if if you can give them a little something that helps them get through the therapy, you know, if the alternative is they can't do therapy because they're so sick, then it, it makes sense to have a little bit of a crutch to just help be able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And that might be something on eval or second visit that if we're like, well, this person is really struggling through this, we might make a call and be like, hey. This is what's happening. I, can you can we have a discussion about this? And is this appropriate? It's not our decision to say yes or no, but it's our decision, I think, to, at least to notify the provider and say, hey, this is what we're seeing. What do you think about something to help them get along without throwing up 10 times during a session? Right. And that could be something that's helpful. So the other vestibular problem you guys you've mentioned is vestibular hypofunction. Is that the same as vestibular neuronitis? What is uh, vestibular hypofunction? Is that the most other most common thing that you guys treat? Yeah, in my practice, yes. Like I generally try to split patients into hypofunction-like things and BPPD-like things. Um, hypofunction-like things could be more of like meniers, migraines, hypofunctions. Obviously, we're going to into detail into the evaluation for each of those things um, and matching treatment, but the style in my, in this all my brain works, the style of how that's treated and the duration of how that's treated is all kind of similar. So a vestibular hypofunction, I think is, is more of a broad term. It might be a, a labyrinthitis or a, a neuronitis. Um, so where the infection or irritation is in the labyrinth, and that's where kind of more of the dizziness symptoms are coming from, or of the vestibular nerve. And you might see hearing changes with some of these or dizziness imbalance. Usually these are preceded by a, like a cold flu or virus that affects that inner ear system or the nerve. And sometimes you see it in like neurological conditions like MS. So it's, it's important to understand like a good history and saying, well, did you have like two or three days of extreme dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and you just like couldn't get out of bed? That's a very classic sign um, of maybe a more acute hypofunction. More often than not, at least in the, the clinic that I'm currently treating it, most I have not come across those people so far. Usually they're people who have like two or three months ago, these symptoms started and they might have forgotten that bad weekend of, of symptoms, but are coming to see me with kind of like more vague dizziness imbalance. And we kind of identify this hypofunction like syndrome treatment. And is the treatment for that etiology specific, kind of like in the BPP in terms of canal location? So 
is the treatment for vestibular neuronitis uh, more different than, for example, many years in terms of what they do, what you guys do in PT? Or is it more of a kind of a, well, these are a group of exercises that we do to help stimulate that whole vestibular labyrinth on that, you know, side or how, how does that look? I guess if we're going to further branch it down, hypofunction symptoms and treatment looks a little bit different than kind of the quote unquote other category, migraines, meniers, cerebellar ataxia, things like that. So hypofunction symptoms and treatment and being a lot of VOR stability. So vestibular ocular reflex, how well a patient's eyes can stabilize when their head's moving or their body's moving. That's something that's usually going to provoke their symptoms. And it's almost like running a marathon, right? The end goal is to be able to run that mileage completely. Um, for the patient, the goal is to be able to shake their head or do the vestibular, uh, the VOR exercise for 30 seconds to a minute without any symptoms. So we need to work our way up into that, just like a runner works their way up into loading their mileage or increasing their mileage. So a patient might start on day one and, and do like two head shakes and be like extremely dizzy and nauseous, especially in the acute phase. Um, and that's somewhere we, we kind of like coach up about, well, you're going to do this three times a day and it's going to be some, there's going to be some symptoms involved and here's some guidelines and I want you to kind of wait for it to settle before you do your next one. And so it's a lot of very specific coaching and guiding about how to kind of gradually build their progressions and, and the duration of how well they can do it. And then it kind of gets progressed over time in terms of uh, more intensity or more duration, more complicated visual stimuli, balance involvement. So we can kind of like progress it and dose it up over time. But that's a very, that's like the hallmark of hypofunction treatment. And I assume these patients do have homework to do their, do their exercises at home too, because it's, you know, I like your, your marathon analogy. It's something where it's like, okay, we're, we're going to be working up to this. You know, every little bit you can do when I'm not there is going to help you get that stamina. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's how I, I phrase it to patients too, is, you know, if you go run and run a mile one day and stop. The next time you run that mile, it's going to be equally as challenging like two months later. So the more consistent you can be three times a day, every day. And that's where that history comes into play. Like if they're a student, you know, might or working in some sort of like dynamic job, maybe not a best idea to do your exercise before you go to work um, <laughs> because it's going to set things off and make you feel like crap all day. So the more we can kind of tailor it to the patient's day and the patient's activities and their tolerance level, the more they're going to be likely to do it. And really reinforcing that the more, like like you said, the more they do it, the faster they're going to progress, the faster they're going to have resolution of their symptoms, and the, the better they're going to get. And it's sometimes it's hard, especially with patients who've had symptoms for a long time, maybe they tried a couple of different interventions to get them to push into those symptoms a little bit. And a lot of the times, unfortunately, the physicians will kind of preface vestibular therapy as it, this is going to make you not feel good. And it might, it might, but I think it's the more we can have that specificity of training and meeting the patient where they're at, the more we're going to get it as close as possible. There's definitely going to be times we're going to miss the mark and make them do something that's maybe a little bit too much and have to backtrack or navigate that. Or there's times maybe we underdose because we're a little nervous. This patient might be able to have a little bit more psychosocial aspects to their care. But the closer we can get to that middle ground and the specificity of their treatment, the better they're going to do, the faster they're going to get better. And, and there is a, um, I think earlier, did you say three to six weeks or what? There is like an expectation that at some point they're not going to have to do exercises every day. They're going to kind of get back. They're going to habituate and be back to like a, kind of a normal level, right? Yeah. So generally like six to eight weeks is kind of the classic time frame where they're going to be done, quote unquote, with seeing me. I sometimes will give patients and say, do these exercises for the next one, two or three months especially if they have maybe had a little bit more rocky of a time during their treatment, like do these for the next three months or one month, depending on the person to just really solidify, really solidify this habituation process, really make sure you're on solid ground, you're where you need to be. And then you can kind of start tapering off from there. And then we'll check in with the patient kind of a long-term basis. You mentioned um, your Meniere's and your vestibular migraine patients. I'm glad you brought that up because classically, I, you know, I generally don't think of those as being good candidates to refer to vestibular PT because they're you know, they tend to have more episodic episodes. <laughs> Scratch that. <laughs> because they tend to have episodes of dizziness. So they're not chronically dizzy all the time. And so I I don't always think of you guys when I think of Meniere's or vestibular migraine. So can you tell me more about what that therapy looks like? Absolutely. So if we're kind of working on like the decision tree, you know, once we're clearing BPPP, once we're more certain that it's not hypofunction, then we're getting into the kind of other category. And that's where this Meniere's 
um, and vestibular migraines come into play. So the evaluation process looks exactly the same. I'm still checking for BPPV. I'm still checking for hypofunction test findings and symptoms. Just because someone has a Meniere's diagnosis or a vestibular migraine diagnosis, I still need to thoroughly check them out. There's been definitely cases where patients have flare-up of their Meniere's symptoms, but also have BPPV, um, and we can get them quicker to baseline if we treat the BPV. And it's, I think it's pretty common for if you have one disorder, you're going to have maybe more than one. So I think still going through that evaluation process, matching the treatment or habituation or desensitization with their goals, with their function, um, with what they want to get back to doing, and safety. You know, these are patients we work on a lot, especially the Meniere's people, um, safety and balance training and just trying to get them more active. I think a lot of times they take this diagnosis and look on the internet and figure out that maybe this is not something that's going to resolve like BPPV will, and they just stop doing everything. And that's something that PT, I think, is, is perfectly positioned to help them kind of coach them through, well, here's, here's some guidelines about what you can do and how we can do it. And um, here's when to push symptoms. Here's when to not push symptoms. Here's, here's some activities that might be more safe for you to do. Here's some maybe things that might stir up your symptoms and how to plan your day. So a lot of like those like life skills and life coaching and kind of goal setting and things like that are, can be really important because we got to spend a lot of time with patients. I know not all physician colleagues get to spend a whole hour with people. So it's, it's important for, you know, that patient report what their goals are. So that's, good. that's a, a large focus compared to someone who has BPV. They don't really get a choice about how they're treated. They get a maneuver, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. it's the goal is probably, I want to get these symptoms to go away, but there's no gray area or creativity in terms of their treatment and even hypofunction patients too. There's no kind of black or white. You're going to get VOR training. That might look a little different if you're a gymnast versus someone's grandma versus an average working adult. So it's going to look a little different, but there's very little gray area with even the hypofunction patients. So this other category, it kind of depends on what the patient's goal is. So if the goal is symptom management, we might do more habituation or desensitization training. If the goal is I want to go and be able to bend over and pick my grandchild up, okay, well, let's work on balance. Let's work on strengthening. Let's work on those kind of things. So it really it depends on the patient's goals. And then the vestibular migraine people is kind of cool because that's where the orthopedic realm kind of comes into play. You know, is there a cervical component to this? And sometimes like when patients don't improve, no matter what type of dizziness they have, maybe we're looking there just, just to check. Cause there are some cases where cervicogenic dizziness is, is a component to the, the symptom presentation. So as we kind of branch into the other category and get a little bit more broad in the treatment, it comes back to the evaluation process, what we find on treatment, what's, what's symptom reproducing, and then what the goals are of the patient are. To me, it sounds like any patient that comes in with dizziness or balance concerns, PT is a great supplement, either supplement, diagnostic, treatment, overall evaluation is extremely helpful to help further tease it apart, to provide overall guidelines, depending on what it is and even specifically for diagnosis and management for specific disease processes. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm biased, obviously, but I think so. You know, we get to spend a lot of time with patients. Um, we get to listen to their, their concerns, and they might tell us things that they don't tell you guys because just the relationship is different. We're asking patients to do things that don't feel pleasant, so there's a level of, like, inherent trust there. Yeah, so that dizzy patient where, you haven't, that, where we haven't found anything on imaging, VNG, our exam, PT is still... Vestibular rehab is a great supplement to keep in our back pocket. Yeah, you know, I, I think we look towards our physician colleagues for helping us to rule out red flags, any sort of imaging or diagnostic testing needs, if appropriate medication management. I personally like to bounce off ideas with my ENT and physician colleagues. I think the patients that have the most success are the ones that are coming from providers that are really collaborative with us. Um, so I really encourage any ENTs listening, like find a, a good vestibular therapist, find someone who, you know, you can talk to and, and form a relationship with because it's only going to benefit your patients. Um, so I think that's, that's extremely important. Patients really, you know, oh, Dr. Smith sent me. Oh, well, we work with Dr. Smith's patients all the time. There's just another trust factor in there that gets built. Um, that relationship starts building because the patient says, well, Dr. Smith trusts Matt to see me. Matt must know something, at least in some capacity. So <laughs> I, I think the more collaborative the relationship can be, the better. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You've given us a lot of really good information to, to chew on. Anything else that we can be doing, you know, as 
as ENTs to kind of set patients up for success as we send them to you? You know, anything that we haven't thought of? No, I think, you know, we've touched on a lot with the collaborative and expectation thoughts. You know, I think looking at things from the other side of the the relationship, when patients come in and the provider has given them some sort of clear expectation, whether it's, I'm pretty sure it's BPV, this is maybe the, the next step in the process and go see vestibular therapist and here's what maybe might happen or hypofunction here. Maybe this is a longer term strategy or maybe it's, well, we didn't find anything and everything looks really good and there's no red flags present. I still think you would benefit from a vestibular evaluation and here's why and just kind of setting them up as, well, everything looks still good. Like there's not anything scary going on. So I think a lot of patients come in and be like, I thought I was having a stroke. I went to the yeah. emergency department. I, I was really afraid. My friend had a stroke and his was like dizziness. So I think the more reassurance can happen on the front end, the easier it is for them to kind of come and be really bought into treatment and kind of understand the, the value and what's happening on our end too. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for coming on the show. If people want to find you, I know you're at Excel Physical Therapy in Northeast Philadelphia. So for all of our Philly colleagues out there, Excel Physical Therapy in Northeast Philadelphia, if people want to uh, reach out, have questions for you, uh, where can they find you? Yeah, so they can definitely look me up at Excel Physical Therapy. I'm on LinkedIn as well. So I think that's how I found you guys initially. Uh, and then we can maybe put my email in the show notes. I'm happy to answer emails from physician colleagues or patients um, who might be listening. Awesome. Well, thank you. you. You're a gem. I'm sure your patients love you. And um, you, you guys are, are miracle workers. I really, that's what I always tell patients. I'm like, this is, you're going to be amazed. They're going to heal you. You're not going to be dizzy. It's going to be awesome. So <laughs> thank you for being a resource thank to you. us because it's, it's mm -hmm. such, it, it's amazing. And uh, thanks for taking the time to come on the show today. Absolutely. I always love talking about this kind of stuff and at the end of the day, the more collaborative we can be with our colleagues, no matter who they are, I think the, the better patients are going to get. So I think that's always a thing that I'm trying to do. Thank you. Thank you for our listeners who stopped by and tuned in. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Apple, and Ghana. Please follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore backtable ENT. Uh, we love feedback, uh, topics, ideas, speakers, or if you ever want to come on the show, please subscribe, rate, and share with a friend. That'll help us grow and bring you more content. And that's a wrap. And it's a wrap. We did it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye.